This morning we begin a brand new series entitled, I Am. And what we're going to do is listen to Jesus in his own words for the next few weeks. Tell us who he is. Everybody has always had an opinion of who Jesus is. In fact, one day Jesus looked at his disciples and asked them, who do people say I am? They had a variety of answers. And if you ask that same question in 2018, you'll still get a variety of answers. The best place to discover who Jesus is, is to let Jesus tell you who he is. So this morning, if you'd like to follow on your screens or uh, in, in your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of John, the 11th chapter and the 25th verse, John chapter 11 and verse 25. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I want to focus on that one statement in that verse. I am the resurrection. Telling us that the resurrection is more than an event, but the resurrection is a person. So just so we're all on the same page, to be real clear, a resurrection is when someone dies, but they don't stay dead because they're brought back to life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He actually said that in the context of a resurrection story with some of his good friends. Jesus had three very close friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They lived in Bethany. They were in relationship with Jesus. So when Jesus said, I am the resurrection, it wasn't in the context of his crucifixion or suffering or death. It was actually about two weeks before his suffering and crucifixion when he went to Bethany and made this announcement at the death of his friend Lazarus. Now this is an important story because this is the domino that was first pushed. It was after he raised Lazarus from the dead that everybody got all upset and It led him to his betrayal, his suffering, and his crucifixion. It was the first domino in the story that led to Easter Sunday morning. So we're going to read that story, and we're going to take from the story three ways that in our lives in 2018, many of us experience death in our souls, in our spirits. Three ways that we can die on the inside and how Jesus can resurrect us back to life. So we're in John chapter 11 in verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. And he wasn't just sick. He was so sick that we read he's going to die. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. These are Jesus' friends. Verse 3 tells us. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus, your friend Lazarus, is sick. And for Jesus, who is several miles away with his disciples, that was bad news because his friend was sick. For Mary and Martha, it was bad news in the middle of a pretty good life. Things were going pretty good for Lazarus and Mary and Martha in Bethany. But then suddenly their life was interrupted with bad news. Most of you in this room have lived long enough to understand this. Life comes in seasons. And you can be going along, enjoying life pretty good. And everything's going your way. And suddenly, your life can be interrupted by unwanted news. You can be blindsided by an unexpected experience. Some of you this morning have got a lot of great things going on in your life. But unfortunately, some of you this morning are hurting right now. Because you've received some kind of bad news in the middle of a pretty good life. In fact, maybe some of you have even heard the same words that were told to Jesus. Someone you love is sick. Someone you care about has been diagnosed with a debilitating or chronic Or terminal disease. Or maybe it came in another form. The business that you built all these years in love is about to fail. The doors are going to have to close. The career that you loved is going to come to an end. The job that you love 
is going to be replaced by new technology. And what you've depended on for all these years is going away. Or maybe it's a friendship that you've had for many years that just seems to be fracturing. And it doesn't look like it's going to make it. I think you all know what I'm saying. In the middle of a good news life, you can have something that is bad and unwanted and hurtful that suddenly interrupts your good life. Lord, the one you love is sick. Then Jesus said something that's amazing in verse 4. Watch what he said. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. I love Jesus because he goes past all of the introduction. He goes past the middle of the story and he fast forwards all the way to the end. And here's what he's saying. I'm seeing things a little different than you're seeing them. You're seeing things as they are, but I'm looking at it as it's going to be. And he said, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, don't miss that. In the middle of their bad news day, Jesus said, I want you to know something. It's, it's distressing right now. It's hurtful right now. It seems unbelievable right now. Your hearts are broken right now. You're afraid right now. But this is not the end. This will not end with death having the last word. But God will actually step into the bad situation. And he will turn what was meant for evil into good. And people will be encouraged. And God's son will be glorified. Let me just give you a quick summary of verses 5 through 14. You can read it sometimes on your own if you like. Basically, they sent word for Jesus to come. And everybody thought that Jesus would immediately drop everything he was doing. And returned to Bethany to be with Lazarus and his friends. But what did Jesus do? Nothing. For two days, he didn't do anything. For two days, while his friends are struggling, and Lazarus is failing in health, he hung out with the disciples. Over in Bethany, they're all freaking out while Jesus is just hanging out. And two days later, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. They said, no. They said, listen, if you go back to Judea, there's people there that will harm you and hurt you. They'll try to kill you, which would have been true. But he said, no, my friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and we need to go wake him up. Now, he didn't mean that Lazarus was taking a nap. It was a metaphor. He said, you know what? They called me when he was sick. But now two days later, he's not sick. He's dead. And I need to go and resurrect him from the dead. And now we meet three characters in the story that I want us to look at this morning. The first is one of the disciples, Thomas. And the other two are the sisters, Mary and Martha. And each of them, in their own way, was dying on the inside. And maybe some of you can relate to what we'll see in Scripture this morning, or maybe it'll be for another season in your life. But if you're taking notes, some of you can relate to Thomas. Thomas was dead in his doubts. In fact, Thomas is notorious for struggling with doubt. We know him As doubting Thomas. All through scripture. He paints the face of a man who had deep ongoing struggles with doubt. In verse 16 we read, then Thomas, also known as Didymus. Everybody say Didymus. Didymus. It sounds like a bad name for a rapper, doesn't it? Didymus. (laughs) So anyway... Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, now watch him, he's being sarcastic. He's sarcastic, doubting Thomas. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus in verse 16, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, Thomas said, this is going to be so bad, there's no way this turns out good for anybody. Because we're going to go back there and they're not just going to kill Jesus, they're going to kill us too. So let, let's, let's all go to the killing fields. Let's go and we can die right alongside of them. Struggle with doubts. 
He didn't see how in the middle of a bad situation, God could ever bring anything good out of it. And I'm just a little bit curious this Easter weekend. I wonder how many of you would be honest enough this morning on Easter Sunday morning to say there's been some times in your life where life's thrown you a curve. Where, where, where you, you expected one thing, but you experienced another. And you had some spiritual doubts and questions at some point in your life. I want everyone who can say, you know what, a part of me can identify with Thomas. Because I've been through some stuff. And I wasn't always going to be the first one to jump out of the boat and try to walk on the water. I've struggled with doubts every now and then myself. Raise your hand if, if you honestly say, I've, I've had my own struggles with doubt. I want to thank you very much for being honest. Some churches don't know how to be honest. I'm glad you know how to be honest. Because here's what I know about every person in this room today. Everybody I know at some point in their life has prayed a prayer and exercised their faith and believed that God could and had faith that God would and then he didn't. And bam! They are blindsided with doubts. Why didn't he do what I asked? Why didn't he do what I prayed? Why didn't he do what I I believed for? I, I, I did everything I knew to do. I stood on every promise. I quoted every verse. I did everything within my power. And I believed that God would. And look, he didn't. Or maybe for you, maybe this is your story. Maybe you grew up in church with, with, with a real childlike, simple faith in God. And then you graduated from school and went to college and took a literature class and you had a bald-headed, beer-drinking, cigar-smoking professor that picked up the Bible one day and brought it into literature class and said, you know what? Everything in this book isn't real and everything in this book isn't true. And then he began to espouse his doubts and his criticisms and his beliefs. And all of a sudden you're in crisis because everything that you believe to be true since you were in Sunday school has now been assaulted by someone who in your estimation is more knowledgeable and more experienced and, and has broader insight than you. And all of a sudden you're in a tailspin of doubt. Is it true? Is it false? I I, I thought I really loved God and I thought I really knew God and I felt like God was real to me and I've had all these moments and all these experiences and I've seen God do good things but now my professor tells me that the Bible is inaccurate and the Bible is not true and it's, it's just stories that are passed on from generation to generation and in that moment you are attacked with doubts. Nobody gets to live a life of faith without learning to deal with the doubts. Maybe you really loved and believed in God. And then something really bad happened to a really good person who you really loved. And you thought, if God is good, why did he let that happen to them? And if he's all powerful, why didn't he stop it? And keep it from happening to them. And suddenly you're in the wash cycle of doubt. Suddenly you're just a little bit like Thomas. There's something on the inside of you that was alive and vibrant and real. But it starts to die a little bit in your doubts. Now, it could be this morning that you're not dying in your doubts. It could be maybe you're more like Mary. Mary was dead in her discouragement. Maybe you just don't see anything good happening in your life. Maybe you can't seem to catch a break. Mary was really discouraged. Look at verse number 20. When when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But what did Mary do? Watch this. But Mary stayed at home. She said, why bother? My brother was alive two days ago when we sent word to him. He didn't come then. He's now waited and my brother's died. There's no no point in me even going out to meet with Jesus. Lazarus is already dead. There's nothing he can do 
to help me in this situation. And you know what? That's the way discouragement works. Discouragement takes the power from you. And you begin to think, you know what? This situation's hopeless. And I'm helpless. And there's nothing I can do to change it or turn it or shorten it. There's nothing I can do to affect it. And we we get caught in the vortex of discouragement. I'm always going to be alone. I'm always going to struggle with depression. I'm always going to be stuck in this dead-end job. I'm never going to have the marriage that I thought I was going to have. And discouragement just leaves you kind of feeling like you're stuck in life. And I suspect there's some folks here this Easter Sunday morning, if they were honest, they would say, you know what, I can relate to that because in some part of my life, I feel kind of stuck in life. Now, it's Easter Sunday morning, so you're not going to show it. I mean, you already went and bought the good clothes for Easter Sunday, and you're wearing them, and you're looking good and smelling good, and you come to church, and some of you know You've been struggling all week long, but man, you got on your Easter clothes and you walked in here this morning, you even put on the Christian talk. Hey, praise the Lord, hallelujah. He's alive, he's risen. The tomb is empty, glory to God. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're smiling on the outside, but on the inside, you're really discouraged. Some folks are dead in their doubts. Some folks are dead in their discouragement. And then others are like Martha. Martha was dead in the delay. She expected God to do something and God took too long. Jesus should have come and helped the family out. After all, they're his friends. He should have come earlier, but he didn't. Why did he take so long? Look at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Everybody say four days. Now we read that and it's like, what difference does it make? What's up with the four days? It seems like to be unnecessary information if he's dead. Why, why, Why do four days matter? Well, four days don't matter to us, but four days mattered to them. Because at that time... They had a belief that after a person died, their spirit would try to associate by staying in close proximity with the body for three days. So that for three days, the human spirit would linger close to the body just in case the body came back to life. And their spirit would stay for three days and move back in and animate the body. But on the fourth day, they believed the spirit left. So in her mind, Lazarus wasn't just dead. He was dead, dead. Because the spirit that hung around for three days, which by the way, Jesus could have shown up in those three days. In their belief system, if Jesus just would have come a little bit earlier, then the spirit that was waiting for Jesus to show up and bring the body back to life wouldn't have left. But now that it's the fourth day, it's totally hopeless. He wasn't just dead. He was dead and then some. He was dead and now there is no hope. In fact, they believed he was so dead that later in the story, Martha tried to describe how dead he was. The King James Version. God bless the King James Version translators for the way they translated this. When she described him, they translated like this. He is dead and stinketh. Stinketh, that must be a holy stink. When you put the F on the end, he stinketh by now. She was just trying to let us know that's how dead he was. If only Jesus would have shown up earlier. But now it's been four days. His spirit's gone. He's so dead that he stinketh. Verse 21. Lord Martha said, if you had been here, Isn't this just like us? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You took too long. Why didn't you come back when you still could have done something about it? Anybody ever felt like at points and times in your life, God was late? Some of you are so religious, you can't even admit it. Let's try that again for a little bit deeper level of honesty. 
Anybody ever feel like in your life God should have and he could have, but he didn't and he just was late? Good friend, Pastor Jeff Peters said, I won't say that God's been late, but there's been lots of opportunities he missed to be early. (laughs) We all feel like that. Every now and then, you expect God to do something a certain way in a certain time frame. And when he doesn't, something in you dies. You die in the delay. Maybe you're waiting for an answer to prayer. There's a lot of great single Christian women thinking, you know what? I'm living for God. I'm trying to live a life that pleases God. I'm serving Jesus. I just want a good Christian man to marry. I'm faithful to God. I'll be faithful to my husband. I just want to get married. And I'm not doing what all my friends are doing. I'm just trying my best to live a good Christian life, meet a good Christian guy, get married and have a good Christian marriage and family. My friends are all going to the club all the time and they go out to the club and do the jiggy jig. And I don't go to the club and I'm not even doing the jiggy jig. But they're out there at the club doing the jiggy jiggy and they're hanging out and hooking up and they're all getting married and I'm still single. Why am I the bridesmaid all the time? When I'm, I'm the one that's living right. I'm the one that's trying to do it God's way. And yet, they're all getting husbands and there's no husband for me. And you feel discouraged. Dead in your delay. Is it okay to say jiggy jiggy on Easter? <laughs> some, some of you look like we need to get the paddles out or something. You're like, oh man, you can't let pastor get a mic ever. Or maybe there's, a, maybe there's a young married couple and all they want is a child and they're trying to conceive a child and they just can't conceive a child. And they look around them and they think, well, I just want to have sons, son or a daughter, children, so I can raise them and give Jesus to another generation, pass my faith along, and can't seem to have a child. And you look around and you think, why, why won't God answer our prayer? Why won't God help us with this? It's a good thing. It's a godly thing. And you begin to look around and think, my God, everybody's, everybody's getting pregnant but me. High school girls that don't want babies are pregnant. And then you run across someone that's already got five kids and they make the announcement they're expecting their sixth. And they don't want another child. They weren't praying for them. They were looking for another child. The child came late, surprised everybody. The new new father had heart palpitations when it was announced. He thought, I was planning on retirement. Now i got to save for college again. You're driving down the road and you think, my God, crackheads are getting pregnant. Everybody's pregnant except me. And if you don't manage your thinking and you don't keep God's word in the forefront, you'll begin to believe that a delay is a denial. You'll begin to believe that because God didn't show up when you thought he should, he's never going to show up. That's not right. God will work on his time schedule and not ours. You're going to think because we haven't had a child yet, we will never have a child. But I want you to hear me this morning. Delays are not necessarily denials. Sometimes God waits because he's got something better in mind for us than we have for ourselves. I know a lot of people that are praying and believing God to heal someone. And I believe that he's the Lord that heals us. And I believe with God all things are possible. And you believe the same thing, so you pray and you pray and you pray. But so many times it just looks like God's not doing it and you feel dead in the delay. I want you to remember this. God's delays are not his denials. And he can show up on the fourth day and fix everything that got broke the three days before. He has a way of taking what was meant for evil and turning it into good. When I worked on on this sermon, I generally, like most all of you, do everything online. I do my study online and my research online because it's so much easier to go to one website than it is to 
have the Strong's Concordance and the Lexicon and Thayer's and, and, and all, the, all the different uh, study books that you need to study something out. It's easier just to click and look. So I almost always study on my computer. But a few years ago, I wanted to, for some reason, just go back to my, one of my old Bibles. And I've got a stack of Bibles. I pulled out one of the Bibles and turned to read this story. And while I was reading, I noticed that the story I'm preaching from this morning is found in John chapter 11. In the Bible that I picked that day, the story started on page 742. Everybody say 742. So it was on page 742 in my Bible. And I read the story. And in my Bible that I was reading that day, on page 742, everything bad happened on page 742. Lazarus died. Thomas doubted. Mary was depressed. Martha was angry. It was all on 742. And then I turned the page. And I looked at page 743. Everything on 742 was bad. But with one turn of the page, the entire tone and direction of the story changed on 743. And let me read to you the first thing I read that Martha said on 743. On page 742, everything's bad. Then on 743, Martha said in verse 22, but I know that even now, everybody shout even now. Yeah. Shout it one more time. Shout even now. Yeah. I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. She looked at Jesus and something suddenly came alive in her. She said, you know what? Even though we're dead in our doubt, in our discouragement, in our disappointment, in our delay, I still know that even now God will give to you whatever you ask. I propose this morning that some of you need an even now moment with God. You need to have a meeting with the one that is the resurrection and is the life. Because some of you have been stuck on 742 and it's been bad and it's been discouraging and you've been depressed and it's been difficult. And God just hadn't acted the way God's supposed to act and he hadn't done what he's supposed to do. And you're in the middle of the trouble and the pain and the disappointment and the unexpected of 742. But I suggest to to you this morning that God is able to give you the faith to turn the page and you can walk out of the doubt you can walk out of the discouragement you can shake off the grave clothes faith can come alive and you can have a 743 moment I believe that even now all things are still possible to the God that we serve even now. Say it with me one more time. Say even now. Even now, now, though you're discouraged, God can rebuild your faith. Even now, though your dreams have died, he can resurrect dead dreams. Even now, he can reach into your family and bring healing and hope and restoration. Nothing has deteriorated so far. Nothing is so out of control. Nothing is so impossible that God cannot give you the faith to pray a prayer, to reach out and trust. You can turn the page. So as I'm reading that story, with one turn of the page, everything goes from bad to good. I just want to say this morning, wherever disappointment and discouragement and doubt and even death are working in your circumstances, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ can bring it back to life. And that's what Jesus did in verse 23. He told Martha, your brother will rise again. She responded in verse 24, well, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection At the last day, she was confused. Jesus was talking about a right now resurrection. And she was thinking about the end time resurrection. So Jesus said in verse 25, he updated her. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus didn't say I'm able to resurrect him. Because he's bigger than that. You need to know when you come to God. God's not real strong. 
He is strength. God doesn't have power. He is power. God isn't real smart. God is wisdom. He is the source and the fountain. Jesus said, I don't want you to think that the resurrection is just relegated to a day that's marked on the calendar somewhere way out in the future in end time Bible prophecy. I need to give you an update. I need to let you understand something. The resurrection is more than a date. It is more than an event. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And whoever believes in me will live even though they die. That's who Jesus said he was. You need to understand as a Christian, you've got more than a, a book full of doctrines and religious dogmas and proper beliefs and proper behavior. You have an experience and a relationship with the one who is the resurrection and who is the life. With the source of hope and goodness. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Verse 26. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I got to ask you this morning. I know many of you believe that a virgin conceived and brought forth the son and you celebrate his birth every Christmas. You believe Jesus went to the cross and died, celebrated on Good Friday. You're here this Easter Sunday morning believing that on the third day, death could not hold him. And he rose victorious over death and hell and the grave. But I've got to make it more personal than that. Do you believe that he is not only the central character in a story that happened 2,000 years ago. But in fact, he is the resurrection and he is the life and he can resurrect what is dead in your life, what is dead in your hopes, what is dead in your heart. He is the resurrection. It's not just what he does. It's who he said he is. So if you're taking notes as I get ready to wrap up and pray with you here in a moment, the resurrection is more than an event. It's a person. And his name is Jesus. And giving life is not just what he does. It's who he is. Let me say it this way. Dead things don't stay dead when Jesus walks into the picture. And the resurrection, the life, Jesus looked at the tomb. Where Lazarus laid and said to the disciples, take the stone away. And when they did, look at verse 43. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Someone said, why did he go to the graveyard and why was he so specific? Why did he say Lazarus, come out? Because he's the resurrection and the life. If he'd stood in that graveyard and said, come out, everybody would have come out. In fact, if you know scripture, by the way, for those that are believers that die with faith in Jesus Christ, that is not the end of the story. Because there's going to be another day that the resurrection and the life is going to say, come forth. And the grave is going to give up the dead. And we that are alive and remain will be caught up with them forever to be with the Lord. Dead things don't stay dead when the resurrection speaks. Verse 44, the dead man came out. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Some of you this morning feel dead on the inside. If you're honest, you say, you know what? I don't have the life and the, the, the living, active, expectant faith I once had in my walk with God. This happened and that happened. And I know. Maybe you're dead in the delay. Or you're dead in discouragement. Or you're dead in doubts. You don't know how to get from where you are to where God is. I simply want to remind you this morning that the same voice that said to Lazarus, come out, is saying to you this morning, come out. But pastor, you don't know how I've lived, but that voice is saying your sins can be forgiven. I'll clean up your past. 
Not because you're good, but because God's good. He can set you free this morning with a simple step of faith. Not because you're so strong, but because he's so strong. Even if you feel you don't deserve a second chance, let me remind you, you didn't deserve a first chance. The Bible said we're all found in the same condition. We were all dead in our trespasses and our sins. The only reason you ever experience God even one moment in your life is because the resurrection and the life said come out of your death and the resurrection gave you life. Don't think, well, pastor, I used to really live for Jesus and I was on fire for Jesus and I served in the church and I was active and I did this and I did that and I used my talents and my gifts and my ability and then this happened and that happened or they happened and all of a sudden my life just took a 180 and I just don't feel like, like I deserve another chance. I'm trying to clear that up for you. You never deserved the first chance. Anything we receive is based on his goodness, not on our merit. We can't get good enough. We can't get holy enough to merit anything from God. We receive freely by grace. So you can feel his presence again, not because you deserve it, but because he's good and he's merciful. Resurrection's more than what he does. It's who he is. So I said, well, pre- preacher, why does, why does that even matter? Matters. Because God did something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. To save us. God became a man. Became one of us. Jesus picked up human flesh. By the way, he didn't just pick up that human flesh for 33 and a half years. When you get to heaven, you'll be able to see the scars in his hand and the wound in his side. He moved from being God to being man forever. And the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He didn't just pick up a flesh and blood body for 33 years. He went from being everywhere simultaneously to confining himself to a flesh and a bone and a blood body. And once he stepped into that body, he lost his omnipresence forever. There's nowhere after the resurrection you ever see Jesus appearing twice simultaneously in different places he had to give up a part of his godliness a part of his deity and when you get to heaven it won't be a story you're going to see the man who stretched his arms wide on the cross you'll see the man who cried the tears you'll see the man who wore the thorns you'll also see the man who then was the lamb but on resurrection sunday he was resurrected from the dead and he's no longer the lamb slain but he is the lion of the tribe of judah he is king of kings and lord of lords he now rules Jesus became a man forever. He lived a perfect sinless life so that he could qualify to pay for our sinfulness. I like to say it this way. For some, it may be too casual. But if you can hear it, it'll clarify things for you. He paid your bill. If you go to a restaurant and order a meal, you pay the check. We lived in sin year after year after year. Jesus said, you know what? They won't have to pay for those sins because I'll go to the cross and I'll pay their bill. One of the reasons that we praise him is because we know what he paid for. He paid so that we could forever, now and in eternity, have a relationship with God. On the cross, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, I did what you sent me to do. It's finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. The Bible says the heavens went dark and the earth shook. And even people who had hope that he was the son of God in that moment had question marks around their hope. It was Friday. The old southern preacher preached the historic sermon. It was on Friday. 
that his beard was pulled out by the handful. It was on Friday that they pressed the crown of thorns in his head till blood streamed down his face. It was on Friday that they spat upon him and mocked him. It's on Friday that they laid the cat of nine tails across his back until his back was like a plowed field. The Bible said there was nothing in him, if you looked at him, that would ever be appealing. Nothing about him that you would want to have a relationship with. It was on Friday that they drove the nails in his hands and his feet. It's on Friday that they pierced his side. Friday is the day of pain. Friday is the day of suffering. Friday is the day when the one perfect person took upon himself the sins of the whole world and paid the price so that all of us who are sinful and imperfect can lift our hands and say our Father who art in heaven. He paid the price. Friday is a painful day. Friday is a sorrowful day. Friday is a dark day. But I like what the old southern preacher said. He said what they didn't know is it may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. The other side of the pain, the other side of the sorrow, the other side of the whipping post, the other side of the cross is resurrection day. And you can't have resurrection without crucifixion. Here's what I would say to you this morning. Some of you think you're stuck on 742. That's your Friday. It's difficult, it's challenging, it's filled with discouragement and doubt. There's more question marks than there are exclamation points. There's more unknowns than there are knowns. You've got more questions than you have answers. And you believe that all your future holds is what's on that page. It's going to be page 742 today and tomorrow. And next week, and as far as you can see, it's nothing but page 742. Here's what Jesus is saying. Why don't you let me turn the page? If you'll just put a little bit of faith, a little bit of trust in me. If you'll just say, you know what? I believe maybe you can do something with my life that I've never been able to do with it. Maybe you could add something to my circumstance that I don't bring to it. I've been stuck on 742. I just want to turn the page. If you'll turn the page with one touch from God, you can go from 742 to 743. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you when you get to 743, everybody's healed and your hair will never get thin. You'll never gain weight again and you'll win the lottery and all the kids will suddenly live perfect lives in line with your expectations for them. Not telling you if you make Jesus the Lord of your life and turn the page from 742 to 743 that It's going to be one unending parade of joy in this thing called... No, that's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is on 743, God always gets glory out of the bad things that happened on 742. And he takes what was meant to harm you and hurt you and destroy you. And he turns the evil into good. And he gives new hope. And he resurrects dreams. And he restores purpose. And he adds fulfillment because he takes what was meant for evil and turns it into good. So Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. We all start at the same place. It doesn't really matter what your story is. What should matter to you is no matter what your story is, God can help you turn the page. You don't, you don't understand how rough a life I've lived. Oh, you don't understand. He's the resurrection. See, what, all you're doing now is telling me how dead you are. I concede you're dead in your sins, in your failures, in your trespasses, in your disappointments. When Jesus is not Lord of your life, death has its stamp everywhere. I'm not going to argue with you about how dead you are. Well, you don't know how long I haven't lived for Jesus, so you've been dead a long time. Dead is dead until resurrection comes. What I'm here to tell you this morning is you have not sinned so grievously. You have not ran so far from God. You have not been in your sin for so many years that he stops being the resurrection and the life. He's still the resurrection and the life. Let me just dump this on you while I got you here. It's totally unfair 
totally unfair that someone could live like the devil for 73 years and then come on an Easter Sunday morning and raise their hand and accept Jesus as their Savior. And he will forgive them of all their sins and give them a fresh start. That's because grace isn't fair. Mercy isn't fair. None of us, and you ought to be thankful for this, none of us get what we deserve because we deserve to pay our own bill. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, totally unfair, that God can come in at the end of a messed up life, wash away my sins, give me a fresh start, a clean slate, a new beginning. That is how good God is. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how many questions you have. Doesn't matter what somebody's done to you. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. Doesn't matter how bad someone who should have been good was been that caused you to say, well, all Christians are just hypocrites. I hear that all the time. That is the most boring, lazy line I've ever heard in my life as a pastor. Well, Christians are hypocrites. Maybe not. Maybe they're just people that have been through a rough life trying their best to make sense out of harmful, hurtful, and bad experiences. I wouldn't be so quick to call someone else a hypocrite. But even if they were, the good news is this. If if we're all hypocrites this morning, we got room for one more, so why don't you join us? (laughs) Let me tell you what we'll try to do. We'll try not to look at your faults and tell you what's wrong with you. We'll try to look at your faith and tell you how good God can be for you. We, we, we will try not to measure you against us. We'll try not to be religious with you. Let me say it that way. Religion's mean. Religion is mean. Religion makes people think they're better than everyone else and somehow they're up here and they're down there and they're close to Jesus and we're in the suburbs. That's, God never intended for you to live that way. We're not going to be religious with you. We're not, going to, we're not going to keep track of your faults and your failures. What we're going to keep telling you is this. You serve a God who is good. You serve a God that is always for you and never against you. And we all started dead in our trespasses and dead in our sins. We don't need to compare how dead we were or how much more dead we were or how much longer we've been dead or how much more serious our dying was. We were all dead in sin. But Jesus gives everyone a chance for a new life. No matter how far you've been away from him or how long you've been there. He loves you. He forgives you. He'll make you a brand new person if you'll let him. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed this Easter Sunday morning. I'm talking to you. If you say, Pastor, you know what? I think I've been dead on the inside. Maybe it was a discouragement. Maybe it was a delay. Maybe it was doubt. But something happened to my faith, and I don't, want, I don't want to stay dead on the inside. I want the resurrection to give me new life this morning. I'm going to ask you, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here this morning and you'll say, I just want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to stand to your feet or come down to the altar. You don't need to leave your pew. But here's what you do need to do. Jesus said, if you're going to believe in me, I need you to make that confession. I need you to make it public. Because I don't ever want you to be ashamed of me. And if you won't be ashamed of me, I won't be ashamed of you. If you'll represent me in earth, I'll represent you in heaven. If you won't be ashamed of me in your life on earth, I will not be ashamed to stand before my father and say, that's my child. Think about that. Accepted in the highest court of the universe. Not rejected by God. He's not angry with you. He loves you. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here today, I'm going to have us all pray the prayer in just a moment, but I just want you to acknowledge. You say, you know what? A part of me has died, but I want Jesus who is the resurrection to give me new life in my heart and my soul and my faith. I want to turn the page. I'm done. I'm done with 742. I want to turn the page and see what good things God has for me in my future. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one's looking right now. 
If that's you, I want you just, with, with no shame or apprehension or fear, throw your hand up towards heaven. Hold it up there real high. Just hold it there long enough so that I can acknowledge and count. There's one and two and three and four and five. And there's six. And there's seven. And there's eight. And there's nine and ten and eleven. And there's twelve and thirteen and fourteen and fifteen and sixteen and seventeen and eighteen and nineteen and twenty. And there's twenty-one and twenty-two and twenty-three and twenty-four and twenty-five. And there's twenty-six and there's twenty-seven. Somebody ought to put your hands together and thank God. He's still the resurrection. He's still the life. Now, would you repeat this prayer with me? Let's say, let's say it together. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I believe that Jesus is your son. That he died, but he is risen. And he lives so I can be forgiven. So I can live for you. Today I give you my old life. And I accept your new life. Give me your Holy Spirit. So I can follow you. For the rest of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Family Worship Center, would you worship God big? Worship Him loud. Thank God for every person that raised their hand.